he was considered um, unadoptable because he showed aggression towards some government employees. And I have to say I'm, I'm with him there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, you got the right horse. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> I think you got um, the perfect horse. I agree. Like, we have the same philosophy, dude. You want to come is home? Is his name Waco or something? <laughs> his name Ridge, is Cortez. Maybe? Oh, okay. <laughs> This is the Farm Hop Life Podcast. I'm Matt DeRozier. Today, my guest is Lauren on Twitter at Lauren in the Wild. She has a farmstead in Northwest Montana. How's it going, Lauren? Going well. How are you doing, Matt? Doing good. Thank you. This has been a long time. I mean, two months almost in the making. You've, you're busy. You're a very busy person getting, getting things done. So I want, to, I want to introduce you. Like Normally, I have a couple things to say on who the person is, but you've had such a crazy life. I can't like just put it down in like two sentences on who you are as a person. <laughs> so you sent over some pictures for me and a couple that you've posted on Twitter as well. Um, thank you for that. So let's, if you want, let's, let's go right into some of these pictures that you sent. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. How do I maximize this? I don't know. Close enough. You can see all my tabs open. I don't really give a crap. Okay. So what are we, what are we looking at here? <laughs> um, so I grew up on, on a large working cattle ranch in the mountains in Colorado. Um, this was at about 10,000 feet altitude, a little bit lower. Uh, we ran uh, registered Hereford cattle um, and we had a grass fed, grass finished beef operation before it was the cool thing to do. Um, so this would have been back in the 80s and into the early 90s. Um, we direct marketed beef to a pretty solid customer base down in Denver. So um, this picture was my father. Um, looks like he's trying to rope some youngins to do some work with them. Um, we ran anywhere from 500 to 1500 head a year. Dang. Uh, as you can see, this is a beautiful little lush valley, but it didn't start out that way. Um, this was my uh, crucible into regenerative agricultural practices. When we started on this ranch, it was very degraded. Um, it had been overgrazed for probably decades. It was basically bedrock um, in most places in that valley bottom with a creek running through it. Um, over the course of about 20 years of careful grazing management, we built up almost a foot of black topsoil and turned it into this kind of green oasis. Um, so that taught me a lot about sustainable ag, about regenerative ag, about grazing management that I've carried into uh, what we're doing now. And I'm sure we'll get into that later. Is that now forgive, I'm just a, I'm from the city, so I'm kind of dumb. Is Was that kind of like revolutionary for its time being like working cattle that way instead of the conventional way? It was. Um, my father is very much a revolutionary. Um, he has never done anything the normal way. So when he took this project on, he did a ton of research he basically decided that he wasn't going to listen to any of the old timers, any of the ranchers around us that were telling him how to do things. He was pretty green when he took this on. Hmm. Uh, actually, he had never handled cattle before. <laughs> so he dove wow. in with both feet. I guess, um, and then some. And then some. Took on this 24-7 job for 25 years and um, just rocked it. Uh, you know, he read some texts. There was a, a, a French... Um, cattle grazier. I wish I could remember his name. I'm sure the regenerative ag folks would, would be able to rattle it off, but um, he was introducing some of these concepts pretty early on. Uh, my dad got a hold of that book and just ran with it. And of course this was, and I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Savory. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this was the progenitor to Alan Savory's work and, and the inspiration for a lot of Savory's work. Um, and then Savory came came along later, and I believe that was also an influence. Um, <clears throat> but mostly it was trial and error and 
just working with the system, working with the cattle, working with the land and finding out what worked and seeing that feedback happening really quickly as the land started to heal. That's super awesome. Do you want me to go to the next picture here? Sure, sure. I, I just uh, opened them in the order you sent them to me. So. Okay, so this was the same property. This was a part of the property that wasn't very managed. Um, we kind of would move the cattle through that to other pastures. So you can kind of see what, this is what the property looked like when, when we started out. Okay, yeah, it's, def it's definitely different, that's for sure. Yeah. Do your parents still own that that space that place there they don't they never did um oh, this was, okay yeah this was uh ten thousand acres that was owned by a very wealthy family um i think mostly they used it as a tax write-off mm. <laughs> so uh this was my dad walked into the management position on this place and um basically was given free reign to do with it as he pleased which was really a special situation, including being yeah. given the opportunity to raise cattle um, our own way and then sell them and profit from them. So it was, it was kind of a cool deal. That's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Cause it, it'd be hard to like do it this way with someone's like trying to micromanage who has no idea how to raise cattle. Like, no, you got to do it just like everybody else. Right. What is this? <laughs> so it's a bit of a leap. Um, oh. so, <laughs> so this was the other strange part of my upbringing. Um, I was I was somehow lucky enough to be born into a family that that was crazy about doing living history and historical reenactment. Um, <laughs> so this is my dad, um, in armor. He made all of the armor. He's an incredible blacksmith and armor. What? I know. Um, and so <laughs> I, you know, I, I tell people about my childhood and, and people tell me I should write a book, but I don't know if, if it would be believed to be honest. Um, <clears throat> so when we weren't ranching, which of course is a full-time job, um, we were diving into all these historical reenactment events and living history events. So um, what that means is we would completely immerse ourselves in a particular period of time, live it as people would have lived in that time period, including the clothes, the technology, the tools, um, and the literature, you know, the music. Uh, <clears throat> and we would do this for fairly extended periods of time just to really get a grasp of what it was like to live in that time period. So we spent a better part of a decade um, really delving into medieval Europe. And this was a part of that. Um, mm -hmm. My father and I spent a lot of time on the international live action jousting circuit, which, you know, is the sport where <laughs> armored knights try to knock each other off horses. It's still a thing that is done. Um, there are these big international competitions where people come from all over the world to compete in this sport. Um, so we judged events. We traveled to these events and my father jousted a bit, although he started <laughs> to get to the point where flying off a horse wasn't necessarily what he wanted to do. So um, <laughs> we didn't do that for terribly long. Um, sure. But we also uh, did a lot of archery, um, traditional weapons work. Um, he hunted elk with that bow that you see there. <laughs> no um, way. I get, good. why am I, why am I surprised? <laughs> just, that's yep, wild. Yep. You put a bull elk on the table with that very bow. Wow. Um, so, you know, it was really kind of a special thing. Uh, and I think you have some photos, um, that I, I, I also sent in this batch of, of different eras that we kind of explored as a family. Um, yep. So still a medieval era. Um, <laughs> his, his suit of armor <clears throat> he made with, um, this very small blacksmith shop he had an armoring shop. Um, everything you can see in that photo, actually he made, he made his sword, he made his armor. He even made the saddle he's riding. I think that's his, his uh, medieval saddle. 
Um, and we would, Jeez. you know, we set up a course and we'd ride our horses and we'd do work with um, swords, you know, we'd chop melons and squash and do horseback sword work and horseback archery and <laughs> things like that. So. <laughs> That's so wild. Can you still do it? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Um, in fact, on our current property, we're going to set up a horseback archery course because that's uh, something I really enjoy. You know what? You could, uh, you could honestly be on like Airbnb experiences or whatever they call it, and like make <laughs> that a thing. Like five hundred dollars a person, like for an hour. Like, we here's the waiver: can't sue us ever. <laughs> that's right. That would so, be crazy fun, actually. People would, people would absolutely pay for that type of thing. I would, to like, just like weird brain thing. I was watching like this History Channel thing a while ago, and like the the Mongolians or whatever, their saddles were high in the front and the back, so they could turn, like, and still like shoot their shoot their arrows while while riding. It, it like made it easier, or whatever. I was like, hmm, that's pretty smart. Yeah, and they had these little short bows that were designed for horseback work, so they didn't poke their horses. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> See, I don't even need to tell you. Just whoever's listening that didn't know that. You already know. You're like in, like, like a professor historian without the degree. You lived it. <laughs> yep. So uh, this was another of the, the history eras we did. Um, so this would be like 1880s Victorian era. Sure. And we, we got stuck in this era for quite a while. It was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so that's my father in the middle. That's me in the red dress. Uh, we would do uh, Victorian fashion shows, a lot of Victorian costume design. Um, all of the dresses you see in this photo and the costuming uh, were made within our family. We didn't buy any of it. Uh, wow. and we, would, we would go to these events where <clears throat> people would either hire us or, you know, we would go to um, kind of exhibit the clothing of the period and, and some of the technology of the period. <laughs> That's so crazy. Is this still while you're living in Colorado, like the, yeah, this was in Colorado, and I believe this photo would have been um, Silverton, which is kind of famous for uh, Victorian. Okay, they, they have I didn't know if that was region. common. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it it is. It's a bit of a cultural thing in in that hmm. particular community. Um, they have an old steam engine train that they run, and you can go ride that train through the mountains. It's it's kind oh, of a cool what thing. still yeah. still. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Road trip. All right, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, the fur trade era. This was the other historical um, living history era that we we did a lot of. Um, that's my dad in the front with his uh, black powder rifle. Um, Let me guess, he made that. He made some parts of that. Um, <laughs> later, he actually did forge a Sharps Buffalo rifle by hand. Nice. Did the whole thing by hand. Um, that's something that someday I will have in my collection. So um, yeah. And, and he hunted with his black powder rifle. You know, he was never one of those, uh, modern firearms guys. It was always the primitive technology. Um, and it put food on our table, you know, and I think that was a big part of the point was, um, keeping those skills alive so that we never became too dependent on modern technology in our family. Um, I think my dad, you know, a lot of this was just enjoying the history and learning about the history and really experiencing it in a, on a visceral level. Um, but it was also very practical, you know, let's keep these skills going. Let's make sure that we're never becoming too dependent. Um, let's, you know, play with some of these tools that, that really are dying art people don't use anymore. Um, oh, yeah. and, some, and some of them honestly are, are a lot better than the modern options that we have arguably. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's crazy how hard people had to work back then for their food, like every day, not just once a month or once a week, every day, they had to just, just go out there and just grind as hard as they can. Otherwise, they're going to starve to death. 
like, mm -hmm. like, you know, putting on a couple miles or whatever, going out hunting or whatever and heading back to the truck and heading home. Like that wasn't an option. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it was a grind and people in that era were extraordinarily tough. I mean, we don't have oh, yeah. any idea today how easy we have it. Like, oh, my hands are a little cold. I'm going to head back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So this was, um, this was kind of a, a fun um, part of our lives. Um, we had this period, uh, authentic camp setup. This would have been, um, you know, 1880s kind of settler era. Uh, so we had our wall tent and we had this chuck wagon that we lovingly restored, um, nice. to perfect historical accurate standards. Um, and we'd go set up this camp. We'd, we'd head off into the mountains with this chuck wagon um, it had its whole, whole <laughs> kitchen box and everything. And um, we'd pick a beautiful meadow and we'd set up a camp and, and cook our food over the fire, spend several days there. Um, of course, fires were built with flint and steel, no matches or lighters allowed. Um, really just living it and, and getting our, our feet really deep into that era. Um, and, you know, people loved this. We would always have 40 or 50 people show up to come do this with us. Wow. Um, they, that's a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They'd come out, they'd bring their kids. We'd make sourdough biscuits and cook them over the, over the fire and elk stew and everybody would drink beer and play bluegrass music. And it always turned into a big multi-day party. People just absolutely loved it. I think people in general, especially today, and this was back in the nineties, but especially today um, people really crave, you know, a taste of authenticity because we're really lacking that in our culture in so many ways. So, and, and even back then, you know, it was, it was such a, um, a special thing for people. A lot of these people were working, you know, city jobs in Denver, living in a suburban house and they'd come out and do this with us and, and just kind of feel really deeply human in a way that they didn't get to otherwise. Sure. What did, if you guys had the chuck wagon, what did the suburbanites use? Oh, they'd bring their modern tents out and, you know, okay. some would sleep in their trucks. And <laughs> okay. Okay. This is, uh, this is like another thing with the popular, like popularity of 1883, people would like, this would be like another Airbnb experience. You could sell them. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Hadn't even considered it, but you know, and, and, this was also normal to me. So looking back on it now, it's like, that was kind of a strange childhood. Um, <laughs> unique for sure. But uh, absolutely. Well, when you're the daughter of like a demigod, I mean. <laughs> Renaissance man, for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Both li like almost literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, here we go. Oh, I'm a little too far zoomed in. There we go. So this is me at about uh, 20. I was about 20 years old here. Um, learning to farm with horses. And uh, this was uh, one of my first times putting a horse in harness and learning how to drive. Nice. Do you, do you still use draft horses or... I don't currently have a team, um, but it is on my list. I would love okay. to get some, some haying equipment and do some haying with, with a team because it's it's a it's a wonderful way to do it. Is it hard to find haying equipment for to do it the old way? Not at all. Uh, actually, John Deere has a, a, a modern line of horse-drawn haying equipment that they sell. Really? Yep. Huh. Yeah, um, working with horses and mules in a farm setting is still quite popular. Um, so there are whole lines of equipment being made. And then, of course, there are people that specialize in restoring the old tools, too. So there's a lot sure. of it on the market. It's easy to get. Um, and good horses are easy to get, too. So um, it's, it's really a nice alternative to diesel-based farming. And I think as fuel gets more expensive, more people will be leaning on this. So... 
Might have to. Absolutely. Can't. I mean, maybe someone will like take their old school hang equipment and put it behind their Prius and try to do it. I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> Is this the uh, trapper phase? This was, yeah, and I think this one got somewhat popular on Twitter for a while. Yes, it did. Um, that was, that's what, this was one of the things that I was like, who is this? Who <laughs> is this person? <laughs> yeah, so this is my mom and dad. Um, they lived in a teepee for several years at like 10,000 feet in the mountains through winters and everything. Um, using horse and, and donkey as transportation, completely off the grid. I mean, completely. They didn't own a car. They didn't have running water. They didn't have electricity. They literally lived like it was 1840, um, rode their horses into town when they needed a few basic supplies, but otherwise lived off the land. And they did really well. They had an incredible quality of life. There were some hungry times for sure. Um, sure. But, you know, it was an experience that both of them talk about very fondly. And um, they were out there for, like I said, several years doing this and uh, just thriving. Crazy. So <laughs> what what year did you say this was or would have been? This would have been uh, right around like 80, I think between 89, 91, somewhere in that span. Were you born then? I wasn't. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was uh, a little bit before I was born. And in fact, they stopped living that way because they had a child, which. Oh, was is, it your fault? Little, it was my fault. It's a little unfortunate. Oh. I think I would have loved to <laughs> been like that. But yeah, so this is our current property here in Northern Montana. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'm assuming because of the anonymity, you're like, that's as far, that's as close as we're going to go. Yeah, it is. Um, that's I, fair. I, Absolutely I, fair. I, I think people who know Montana can probably identify it from photos, but. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've only been up that way a handful of times, so maybe not. Maybe I'm not sure. But yeah, we'll we'll just reverse image search it and we'll find you. That's right. <clears throat> um, so this is, uh, this was one of the first days we had our herd of cattle on the property. Um, we bought this property a couple of years ago, but we've only been living on it for about six months and oh. we're very much in the early stages of setting up our regenerative ag systems here. Um, of course the cows are an integral part of that. You can't, you can't, uh, really have regenerative ag without the grazers. So this was, I think the first or second day that we brought the cows here. It was a very special day for us. That's awesome. I do. That reminds me, I'm going to make a note somewhere. I don't know where, since I'm sharing my screen, it'd break the flow, but we almost need to talk about the documentary cowspiracy, but let's put a pin in that. If you've seen it, have you I seen haven't. it? I have not seen it. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've had a couple it, of your blood would boil probably. <laughs> I had a couple ex vegan friends tell me about it, but <laughs> okay. Okay. So you, you get the gist of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a couple of our milk cows. This is Amazon and Flossie. <laughs> <laughs> why, uh... why Flossie? I did not name her. She she came with that name. I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm thinking too, like, rationally. Like, sometimes names are just the name and doesn't have to mean anything. Yeah, these cows came out of a, a very large herd of brown Swiss dairy cows. And I think they just kind of got assigned some random names when they were born. Okay. Without a whole lot of meaning. So. Hmm. Although it, the name Amazon makes me think, like, what if you could actually buy a milk cow from Amazon? Like, <laughs> that, wouldn't that be something? Yeah, shipping might be a problem. Two-day free shipping if you're a Prime <laughs> member. 
Nice. That's gorgeous. Mm. This was uh, about a month ago. Um, our first significant snow here. And this cow is very special to me. Um, she is a Normandy cow. And the Normandy cows are going to form the nucleus of our dairy program here. Oh. They are uh, a French breed, obviously, if you, <laughs> if you know about the Normandy region. Um, they were imported uh, into this country um, as a beef and dairy breed. So they're dual purpose. And they're, um, they have an extraordinary ability to produce really well on nothing but grass. Um, I don't know if you're very familiar with dairy cows, but most dairy cows in America are very grain dependent. So these cows are going to be our grass-based dairy um, pioneers, we could say. Um, the, the brown Swiss cows that we have, like you saw in the last photo, um, wonderful cows. I, I really love having them on the milk line, but uh, I mean, they take 10 to 15 pounds of grain a day to keep their production going, which to me is, um, it, it's a significant dependency that I would like to not have for our farm. So these Normandy cows are, are renowned for their ability to produce incredible qu quality and quantity of milk without the grain inputs, just on grass. So we're really leaning into these cows. Um, they're hard to find. They're still pretty rare in this country. There are some breeders starting to pop up, um, but they are. This is the seed stock for our breeding program here for these. Okay, <clears throat> are you? So you're you're trying to breed them on your property, or you're tr like you're just bringing in like artificial insemination type. Yeah. So we brought this cow in and a heifer. Um, and they will, they will both be AI'd. We're going to import, um, some Normandy semen from France and get, get a herd started. Um, we're also looking at doing some embryo transfer, transfer in the future. Um, and also crossing the Brown Swiss on some Normandy bulls to try to bring some of the, the hybrid vigor and, okay. and reduce their dependency on grain and see how that goes. That'll be interesting. That'll be an interesting cross. Okay, so this is the other thing that you sent me today, and I was like, here's another, like, what, how do I introduce this person? <laughs> so um, this was a, a special period in my life. This was uh, when I was about 24, 23, 24. Um, I was given an opportunity to go live on the Blackfoot Reservation here in Montana uh, to volunteer for a program <clears throat> that was it was a an equine based program where we we had a herd of um old blackfoot native horses that this man that that had this property was working to preserve um they were called buffalo runners they were the horses that the blackfoot used to hunt buffalo wow. on the plains uh he had some original bloodlines he was breeding and preserving them uh and he invited me to come and stay on the property and to help out with this program. Um, big part of what he was doing was, was bringing the horses and at risk youth together um, and using the horses as kind of a, a conduit for the culture to bring kids back into uh, the traditional Blackfoot ways. So it was, it was a, a pretty amazing thing he was doing. Um, we had tribal elders that would come and teach the Blackfoot language we would teach the um, traditional skills like hide tanning, butchering, hunting, uh, working with horses, of course, riding. Uh, and my part of this was was the horsemanship aspect. So mm. I was given this teepee by the tribe to live in while I was there. Um, it was called Ponakomita Otan, which was the horse lodge. And uh, I would work with the horses and work with the kids, teach the kids how to ride, teach the kids horsemanship and train horses to be safe for the kids to work with. Um, it was about 16 hours a day of work every single day, <laughs> but, but it was uh, an amazing adventure. And um, it sounds I, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I, and I feel like some, some really cool connections were made um, both with the horses and the tribe and the kids who 
found roots that they didn't know they were missing. So we'll we'll go through a couple of these photos. Do you, and I, I got some questions about this experience. Sure. Um, so this was one of the, the young fellows that came into our program um, and some of the horses. <clears throat> he was uh, he was going down some some wrong roads, let's say. I don't want to share too many details. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of the kids that came into this program to work with us were were at the end of of the road. It was it was like if they didn't turn things around, they were going into the system. You know, we had a lot of um, drug users, we had violent offenders, we had kids that were getting into all kinds of trouble, um, and they were kind of given a choice: go into this program and reform and work through this, or you know, go into the system. Um, so we had several several kids um, a week come through and, and work with us. And some of them were residential. Some actually lived on the property. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that the horses were the major conduit for helping these kids mm -hmm. get their lives together. We didn't really do a lot of work with the kids. The horses did the work with the kids and it was incredible. So that's interesting that you say that. I just interviewed a uh, woman in New York who has an autistic son and she's using it she's using goats to help bridge the gap of like her her um nonverbal autistic son to have a connection with like living things and like the progress has been amazing and so there's what we briefly talked about there is like there is something about working with animals that there i, I it's like Maybe it's a mystery. Maybe it's not. I don't know. What What do you think it is? I think it's many things. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with autistic kiddos too in in equine programs, and you know, if I don't know if you've read Temple Grandin's work, uh, the she, name sounds familiar. Okay, she's uh, University of Colorado. She teaches humane animal handling, uh, but she is herself autistic. She was told early in life and her parents were told that she would never read. She would never probably be verbal. She'd always have severe difficulties. Now she's a professor at Colorado State. Um, so she writes in her books about how a lot of kids, especially kids who are um, atypical or have learning disabilities or are autistic, um, think more like animals think than like the rest of us think. Um, she wrote the book Thinking in Pictures, which is a spectacular read where she talks about how um, as an autistic child and as an autistic woman, she tends to have a more um, nonverbal thinking pattern where she she thinks in images and pictures and almost like archetypes more than she thinks in words like a lot of us will. We'll have a monologue in sure. our mind. right? But apparently... Um, according to her, she has never had that experience. She thinks in a more kind of visceral and, and um, image-based way, archetypal way. Um, and she believes that animals also think and experience the world in a similar way. So that when you take an animal and like an autistic kid and put them together, the, the, the child can often relate better to the horse than he can to, you know, the neurotypical people around him. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because I've, I've seen this. I've seen horses and kids connect and even even kids who are who are neurotypical, but just having difficulty in life. Um, they connect in a way that's really powerful. I think in the case of these Blackfoot kids that we were working with, um, it was probably the, the relationship with the horse was probably in a lot of ways one of the more functional relationships in their lives. Um, wow. You know, the horses don't come with judgment. They don't come with manipulation. They don't come with abuse. They approach you very directly, very honestly. And they they seek a connection. And it's a really authentic connection that doesn't have strings attached. So I think just that is really potent for kids who maybe have never had that experience. You know, I mean, like that's 
that would be the ideal human relationship, human to human, right? But most of us don't get to experience that very often. Um, but with the animals, it's a given. So as long as, you know, there's safety and, and no one's getting hurt, then real connections can can be forged with kids and animals that maybe aren't safe to have at home or with their peers. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. I guess it makes sense that animals would, would see in pictures because I haven't seen a horse ever write its name, but like, so they just don't have like the, the language, like it's a, well, it's a language. It's just different. Not how we think about language. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they, they communicate with body language and energy, right? I mean, it's a little, yeah, that's true. Maybe yep. a little woo to talk about, but um, you, you know, if you, if you spend any time in a herd of horses or even a herd of goats as prey animals, they're very attuned to their environment and to the intentions of the animals around them. Right. If there's something that's going to want to eat them, they're going to, they're going to notice that. Um, so they're, they're sensitive, um, they're nonverbal, they're very tuned into the environment and they're very present, you know, they're not sitting there worrying about like, well, you know, what am, am I going to get that promotion next week? Or, <laughs> you know, am I yeah. going to die three years from now? They're, they're in the moment, they're present. And I think that is also really beneficial to all of us when we relate to them, we can, we can become present and, and come back to the moment and, and kind of let go of some of the, the, the neuroses that we all kind of have to carry around to get along in life. Yeah, I don't think it's really that woo. I mean, people that are disconnected will probably think that it's very woo woo. But like the more it's like people are like the more you experience it, the more you have to believe that it's true, that there is there is some sort of like connection. I remember I was I was working around some cattle one day, some just some milk cows or whatever. And I was like in like a bad bad mood for some reason not sure why early 20s garbage probably and like this this one cow or whatever was kind of like the the alpha like milk cow i guess and like she like she must have sensed that i was just like oh just a few <laughs> and like picked up her head and her horn got me right beneath the eye and thankfully there it was tipped so I, oh. like it barely broke the skin, but I'm surprised it didn't break my cheekbone. To be honest, I was like, "Oh, I better I better correct my attitude, or this thing's gonna kick me right in the chest." <laughs> yep, they will. They know they're they're so aware of us. Sometimes more than we're yeah. aware of ourselves. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Hmm. So this was on the property um, where the, the uh, on the Blackfoot reservation. Um, and so this would be like East Glacier, Montana, Browning, Montana, if anyone's familiar with the okay. area. Um, and this was just a couple of stud horses having it out and uh, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. That's very cool. That's very cool to cool. see. That's cool. Especially with like the, the backdrop and everything. That's it's great. Hmm. Um, this was also a couple of stallions, a couple of different stallions. We had uh, multiple herds on this property and we kept them very much like wild horses would organize themselves. Okay. Um, it was a very large property. It was about 600 acres. And um, so we allowed the horses to um, kind of sort out their pecking orders, choose their mates, um, you know, set out their family groups the way that they wanted and create kind of a, a natural family group system um, as wild horses would, which was interesting to watch. Um, you know, I, I, I've never had the opportunity to observe wild horses. So um, 
it was it was special to see that and and just I would sit out sometimes for hours and just watch them and and how they interacted and learned a lot about horse psychology and about human psychology to be honest um watching them you know in a in a kind of unmanaged uh situation sure does this when horses do this what does what does it mean what are they doing what are they doing so this was two intact male horses, two stud horses. Um, the two family groups had kind of come together. So in, in, in horse society, there is one alpha male who runs the herd and then a bunch of females that connect to him and then all their babies. Um, so this was two, two alpha males <laughs> coming together and kind of squaring off. Um, first thing they always do is sniff each other's noses and share breath. And then mm. from there, it usually erupts into a fight. So oh, about 10 like seconds what after we the just show, saw, it, they start. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Kicking, biting, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out who's the head honcho. So yeah, about 10 seconds after I took this photo, this erupted into a screaming, squealing, kicking fight. <laughs> Jeez. I was going to say, because this looks like a very nice, peaceful moment. And then you're saying 10 seconds later, it just gets violent like just it did like extremely violent i think huh. blood was drawn in this if i remember correctly <laughs> people were like oh wow that's so beautiful and like just wait <laughs> last one here mm, so this was just the view from the tp site where i lived but that didn't get old no never it was a work of art every day. So you said this is Browning area. You must be looking west, obviously, the sun's setting. And so then the, we're looking towards Glacier National Park, I'm assuming? Exactly. Yep. That's okay. the Rockies, and that is Glacier. Cool. Very cool. Well, um, that about does it for the episode. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh <laughs> uh wow that was cool um now to actually get into uh, the questions that i wrote down um so when did you so you grew up in colorado when did you actually move to montana then and like get started like where you are now mm. um so we moved to montana in the late 90s uh fleeing the crowds that that were um consuming colorado and uh but it took a long time to get where i am now um i had a small homestead in the big fork area of the flathead valley for about a decade um i bought that place in my early 20s and farmed it for 10 11 years um and learned a lot uh i that's that's kind of when i discovered permaculture practices um, started uh, learning and teaching in that sphere a bit, um, playing with things, seeing what worked. And then I um, got to a point where I'd outgrown that property. So uh, my husband and I met around that time and decided to just jump in both feet to a bigger piece of property. And that's how we landed here. Nice. That's cool. What I noticed about what about Colorado is that people that grew up there, like they'll retire, like Coloradoans, I guess, will retire in Montana. Like we've got uh, <laughs> in construction and we've got clients right now that bought like a $1.5 million property near my place that been in Colorado most of their lives. And now they're in like their sixties. Like we, it needs to be a little quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anybody in Colorado, then you're in Colorado now. Colorado. We're thinking about Colorado. Just skip Colorado, but don't move here. We're full. Montana's full. <laughs> we only have so many resources. We'd love to have you, but like so I, you're in Montana. Then. I am. I'm in the Bitterroot Valley. Oh, okay. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, we're it used to be poverty with a view, but now it's just um the view and no poverty. <laughs> <laughs> so 
<laughs> there's there's pockets of poverty. Let me tell you, there's absolutely pockets of poverty. Um, but anyways, so the place that you're you're at now, how um, what was the acreage at your last place, and then what do you what do you have for acreage now and size of your herd and everything? Yeah, so um, my my first homestead that I bought in my twenties was two acres. Okay. Um, and I, okay. Farmed, I farmed it really intensively, including livestock and everything. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, I moved with my husband to his homestead property, which was 11 acres in the flathead. And we did that for a couple of years. Um, and then this property that we have now is 120 acres. Nice. That's, that's a big chunk. Mm. So. Yes. <clears throat> So you said you started permaculture in your two acre um, homestead. Um, are you PDC certified? I am not. Um, that's okay. something I would like to do at some point. Okay. Um, I was no, just curious, just, like where you got your training and everything. Lots of reading. Um, okay. And actually I was, I was lucky enough to work with Ben Falk early on um to design my two acre property he wow. lent me a ton of his time and helped me design out that thing and it was incredible and of course now he's he's a much bigger deal in permaculture he was he was pretty young at that point um but he did an amazing job so sure i bet a uh, complete side question um so like you selling that that property that you know everything's got a purpose, right? Everything has a place and how it was done and everything. Do, when people buy something like that, do they know what they're buying or they're just like, looks nice and just like, don't care? <laughs> like, don't care. Um, I did not sell it. I still have it. Oh, what are you doing with it? I'm just curious. Yeah, so uh, a good friend of mine stepped in and took over the place, and uh, I was happy to hand it off. He's maintaining it well, um, and he's covering the mortgage on it, so it's a win-win. Um, and so he's kind of taken taken the the torch. He doesn't uh, farm as intensively as I did, but he definitely loves to garden, and um, he's he is reaping the benefits of all the design there. <laughs> oh yeah, because that's. The startups, the hard part, the as it grows, it gets easier. So he should I think he should be paying you more than whatever he's paying you now. <laughs> well, hey, you know, knowing knowing that somebody understands um what has gone into that place and is willing to maintain that, that that to me is payment enough. That's fair. Like, yeah, I, I don't really like these things, so I'm just gonna start ripping them out. Like, don't you touch that. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what it took to get that there. And, you know, if this one's get taken out, all these other ones that's, you know, this guild is just going to totally collapse. And That's right. Don't do it. So, yeah. Don't do it. You don't touch it. Uh, so, so your current place, what's that look like? Um, so it's, it's got a lot of good stuff going for it. Um, we bought this from an old rancher who used this as kind of a summer pasture holding space for his cattle periodically. Um, there's no house here. There's nothing here. There's not even, there wasn't even a well here. Um, so we're, we're building everything from the ground up and it's been a heck of a lot of work. We've been here six months now, um, but it's coming along and it's, it's got some amazing uh, it's got some amazing aspects. So it's got a lot of pasture. It's got a lot of um, kind of different microclimates around the property, warm spots, cool spots, uh, deep valleys, high, high plateaus. Um, it has a creek running straight down the middle of it, which is just fantastic. And it has uh, at least one artesian spring on it. That's quite productive. Um, we haven't done anything with it. That's, that's like one of those things that you, you tread extremely carefully before you make any changes. Um, so at this point we just kind of look at it and enjoy that it's there. But, uh, at some point I think we'll probably, um, uh, maybe try to design a spring fed pond around that, that feature, um, and see how it does. 
but uh, at this point, it's it's all about putting in our infrastructure and um, getting ourselves a house <laughs> where we are living in our fifth wheel camper. So um, that's had its challenges through a northern Montana winter. But sure. um, we're hanging in there. We're building our house. We're DIYing basically everything here. Um, we just put our greenhouse up. Um, house is coming along. We're uh, we're building our house from the ground up. We've got a sawmill. We're cutting our own timbers, making our own lumber. Um, so we've we've definitely bitten off a large project here, but we're loving every step of it. That's awesome. Are you? So with having a sawmill and everything, are you just doing conventional stick framed house or are you going like some, some different? Are you kidding? <laughs> conventional stick frame, man. No. Um, That's so why I asked. There's... That's why I asked. Cause I figured you wouldn't have done that. No, no. So we have, we have created this really insane design. Um, it's never been done before as far as we know. We have a, a designer that we've worked with who who's a, an architect and an engineer all in one package with timber frame experience. So what we're doing is is a hybrid uh, timber frame and um, it's not quite a net zero home, but it's going to be awfully close. So there's this product called Nexim that comes out of Canada. It's a, an ICF that doesn't have styrofoam. So insulated okay. concrete form. Um, and what it is, is it's 55 pound blocks that are about 16 inches thick. They create a 16 inch thick wall. You pour concrete down in them. They're insulated on the outside, but thermal mass on the inside. Okay. And they all tie together and create this beautiful monolithic concrete wall. So we're using that as our wall system and um timber frame for all of the the traditional you know framing aspects for the roof and all of that so um it's it's a uh, it hasn't been done this before wild. <laughs> what you, is it did you look up next yes i did what uh, is this made out of so they take wood pulp from like wood uh wood sawmill you know duff i guess yeah. And they yeah. they have a process, a proprietary process, where they remove the starches and the sugars from the wood, and then they um, replace that with a mineral complex and uh, mix it all with a Portland cement. So it, it looks like a big cement block, but it's actually concretized wood pulp. Um, it's kind of like hempcrete, right? If you're familiar with that product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. you can cut these things with a circular saw right on the job site. Uh, they're really cool to handle. They're they kind of fit together like big Legos, so it creates a really stable wall. Um, and as you can see, like in the yeah in that photo, um, it's got a rock wool insulation toward the outside of the wall. <clears throat> that's that kind of yellowy looking tan stuff. Um, and then where the rebar is sticking up, that's where you pour your concrete. And so that's it creates like so a, a honey. Cool. Room. Aren't they cool? So it creates like this honeycomb of concrete that ties all the blocks together and creates this monolithic concrete structure. Um, these things are incredible. They are fireproof. They're pest proof. They're waterproof. They've taken these blocks and sunk them in a lake for two years and then pulled them out and built with them. And they had no structural changes whatsoever <laughs> after all that water exposure. Um, so they're, they're really cool. And it kind of creates like this castle effect when you build with them, you can kind of see in a couple of these pictures. Um, and, and then, you know, you have this like 16 inch thick wall that just collects all the heat from inside, keeps the elements out pretty amazing and, and has stopped bullets in tests too, which is kind of a cool feature. <laughs> you might need that. Right? You might you might make some enemies on on Twitter and uh, they'll be coming for you. <laughs> I should probably that stop trolling cool. people. But we, we might get to that a little later because I find it really funny. <laughs> that's that's so cool. So so do you? Um, I'm a huge huge fan of alternative building methods despite being in, in construction and being only in like stick frame houses. I did one um, uh, SIP house 
uh, mm-hmm. structurally insulated panel. That that thing was garbage. That is trash. That is a trash <laughs> building method. Um, but but anyways, um, so seeing things like this, absolutely cool. This I did not. So when I asked you the question, I had no idea you were doing this. I don't think you've shared this, um, but that's Mm-mm. amazing. Your little nuggets of like, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, uh, you know, so when so, you, so when so we, go ahead. I was just going to say, when we started this process, we, and, and I have to give a shout out to uh, a couple of accounts on Twitter that are hardcore traditional architecture geeks. Um, for kind of turning us in this direction. But when we started this process, trying to figure out how we wanted to build this thing, um, one of the guiding principles was that we wanted a house that would be there for 500 years. And these fit the bill. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Last question before we move on. Um, When do you, so foundation poured, about gonna be poured this, this spring? Nope, it's poured. Okay. So when do you guys start built using your Legos this spring? Uh, we have started. We've got our walls about seven feet high. Wow. That's cool. That's amazing. I'm this summer, I might take the family and take a road trip just to see your place because I this is, this is fascinating. It's fascinating. Please, you are welcome. Come on up. That'd be that'd be so cool. Um <laughs> So I remember uh, not too long ago, you you um, you had a tweet about um, the size of your your current herd, something like off the top of my head because I'm a good note taker. Um, like 25 head of cattle, 150 mm-hmm. chickens, and something else. Yeah, is there something yep. else? Um- yeah, we've got we got a few pigs and we've got dairy goats and some horses okay. floating around. Do you want to talk about how how all those work together in um in your system? Yeah, absolutely. Um so, you know, the cattle are the foundation always in in a regenerative ag setting. Um the well, grazers are <laughs> Good, good. Come at me, bro. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and we, we, we have shamelessly ripped off a lot of uh, great techniques from people who are just beyond experienced in this stuff um, with, with more knowledge than I'll ever have. Um, so, you know, we, we have taken a lot of inspiration from Joel Salatin in our, our cattle and chicken processes. We have our rotational grazing. Um we definitely rotate harder and, and do harder impact than I think he does with his cattle. Um, but we're in a very different climate and we're, we're trying to repair some seriously overgrazed ground. So we're using some methods that um, he probably does not use because his place is so much further ahead. Um, but the cows are, are the foundation of that. And um, then we follow the cows with the chickens. The chickens kind of act as our, our uh, harrowing team and our property cleanup. They go through and scratch through all the cow pies, keep the fly eggs down, um, eat all the bugs and kind of, you know, create a, a nice um, top layer of fertility there. Um, we also have uh, our geese that help guard the chickens and guineas, which help with the, the insects as well. Um, the pigs we use as a giant tilling machine. So we run them anywhere that we want to really disturb the ground. And, you know, like if we want to plant, um, if we want to seed, if we want to remove, uh, the vegetation completely from an area, strip it down so that we can get it ready, cultivated, that's where the pigs come in. Um, and then beyond that, the goats also kind of fulfill the role like the cows do, but they're much harder on the land. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about how we manage them. They tend to eat more thoroughly than the cows do. They graze down harder, um, which can be a benefit if you wield it right. But um, we rotate them as well. So everybody's in portable electric pens. Everybody gets moved frequently. Um, and we just kind of let the land dictate what it needs. You know, we watch very closely um, see how how quickly the the uh, forage is being eaten down, 
see how quickly the recovery is happening. Um, take good notes, pay attention, take that feedback, observe, observe, observe. That's always the key. Um, and then, you know, act carefully from there. Um, specific breed of pig that you use? They're Mangalitsas. They're That's becoming uh, very popular. I think between Kuni Kuni and uh, Mang Mangalitsas, you got a 50 50 yeah. shot at guessing right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Kuni Kunis are cool. They they graze, and I hear they they don't root as hard uh, as some other pigs do. The Mangalitsas are they're nice in this climate because they have hair. You know, they have a lot of wool on them, so they don't require as much shelter and as much feed to keep warm. Um, we've been really happy with them, and the pork is just out of this world. It's it's the best pork I've ever had. I've heard. I I bought one. I don't even remember what the cut is. It doesn't matter. It it was amazing for uh, for like like a Christmas ham type of thing, and it was really really good. Whatever the glaze I put on it, it paired with ham, it was like eating candy. I think I ate it for breakfast like three days in a row, and then it was gone. So, it was yep. really really good. <laughs> um, so in addition to your livestock. You have horses. You adopted a wild horse from the Bureau of Land Management. How, take me through that process. Like, what is what is that like? So that's an interesting process. Um, there's a lot of um, argument happening right now um, about the BLM's methods of managing the wild horses. Uh, basically, they manage them as a feral species. So they have almost carte blanche to remove them. Um, <clears throat> there are people that will argue, um, and I, I tend to be more in this camp, that horses are native to North America. We know they are. They, they evolved here. Um, they originated here. They very possibly never disappeared from here. So that's, that's the crux of the issue there. Um, the BLM claims that the horses, although they originated in North America, they did disappear they went extinct and then they were reintroduced by the Spaniards, um, which is what enables them to manage them as a feral species. Uh, there's some good evidence that they never really disappeared here. Um, there have been some findings up in Canada and the permafrost of horses that are quite, quite a bit more recent than the, the date of their supposed extinction. Um, so this is a bit of a legal tangle that's starting to come out. Um, mm. It's very possible that the BLM will end up at some point having to manage them as a native species, just like they do deer and elk, which is a whole new can of worms. Um, but for now, they round them up. They use helicopters um, to round up whole herds of horses off the prairie. They run them into pens. They castrate them, vaccinate them, deworm them, brand them, and bring them into civilization and attempt to adopt them out. Um, they do their best. They can't adopt all of them out. There are thousands upon thousands of horses standing in government holding pens right now being fed on the taxpayer dollar, um, <laughs> which, you know, is also a can of worms. Um, but they, they do try to adopt as many as possible. And that's where this guy that we have came from. Um, he was actually a, a BLM reject. He was considered um, unadoptable because he showed aggression towards some government employees. And I have to say I'm, I'm with him there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, you got the right horse. I don't know what the problem is. I think you got um, the perfect horse. I agree. Like we have the same philosophy, dude. You want to come is home? Is his name Waco or something? <laughs> his name Ridge, is Cortez. Maybe? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, so he was sent to uh, a secondary kind of reform program for troubled horses. <laughs> um, that sounds ridiculous. I know. I know. So there are these uh, like these Joe people. Biden's called... dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um 
there <laughs> there are these uh, these people who volunteer. They're called tip trainers, TIP, and uh, they take the the troubled horses from the BLM and and try to work with them, train them, reform them, and and make them more adoptable. So he went through that process and um, came out the other side doing really well. Um, he's never shown any sign of aggression toward me because I'm not a government employee. So, um, and, uh, now he's home and he's doing really well. We, we work together a lot and, um, I think he's going to be a fantastic horse. He's smart as the whip. He's, he's incredible. So, uh, I'm excited to see how he turns out. Nice. Very cool. Um, why do we need to get rid of wild horses? Do we need to get rid of wild horses? Are they problem? Some would say they are. Um, what do you, you think? Know, it, uh, well, I think I think they're a problem for people who are leasing BLM land for grazing. They are competing with the cattle and the sheep that are out on BLM land. There are uh, cattlemen who who think that the horses shouldn't be there. Um, they're quite a powerful lobby. They put a lot of money into. Imagine that. Right. They put a lot of money into getting the horses removed. They don't want the competition. Um, right now, the BLM has some kind of what I think are, are crazy requirements or uh, restrictions, we should say, around the horses and the number of horses that are allowed to be out there. Um, you know, it's it's something like one horse for every 5,000 acres. I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's, it's really minimal. Um, they've worked really hard on removing the horses. They, they bring them in through the roundups, which are quite violent. Um, they, they often lose horses, horses die in that process. Um, and then they also have a, a, um, a contraception program. They bring the horses in, they inject them with birth control drugs that last several years, implants, and then they cut them loose. So it's, it is, it is very much a concerted <laughs> effort to remove them. That sounds so ridiculous. That's your tax dollars. <laughs> that's, that's the solution. Yep. Oh, what? What? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's like a whole political thing. There are people on both sides of that debate that are quite passionate about it. So, for better or worse, I guess it's just best to be stuck in the middle and just be like. Just laugh. There's like, is like, what are you gonna do? Okay, right. so you might have mentioned this. What? So what? In I didn't think we were gonna be talking about your wild horse for so long, but <laughs> I didn't realize it was. This is like a can of worms for me. This is like a whole whole world. I had no idea. Why did you uh, adopt this horse? Um, I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I had some connections to the tip trainer that was taking these, these horses that are, you know, needing to be reformed. Um, and she shares pictures of them and their progress and how they're doing under her care. And, um, his pictures popped up and I just, I don't know what it was. It was like this gut heart, sudden connection. Like, oh, I have to, I have to meet this horse. I don't know what it, what it came from. Um, I was not looking for a horse at the time at all. I have two others that are, you know, totally sufficient for what I need. Um, but uh, there was something about him. So I went and met him, completely fell in love and decided to bring him home. Went through the adoption process, which is a, a bit of an ordeal with the BLM. Um, and uh, they approved me and, and I brought him home and I've been very happy with the decision. Good. Um, I'm surprised. So is it expensive? Uh, it's $125 to adopt a horse. Okay. That's not bad. Because mm -mm. they were even playing like radio ads down here. Like, um, hey, come get a, I don't know what they call a wild, wild, like a BLM horse. I forgot what they call it. But they're like, come get it plus $1,000 to take care of it. And I was like, hmm. I don't know. Can you? get it and turn it I know it's like turn it into dog food I don't know like down here in the Bitterroot someone could do that I don't know 
that does happen um unfortunately oh, yeah uh there have been many cases where people were getting truckloads of these horses shipping them to mexico or to canada for slaughter um truck loads truck loads yeah and uh in fact years ago um i had a bit of a tangle with conrad burns who was our elected representative here in montana he, was, that sounds just like a bad name. Like this guy's he, trouble. Yeah, he was trouble. Conrad. He was on the appropriations committee. I think it was agriculture. Um, and he slipped this little writer into a funding bill, which was really sneaky. Nobody saw it uh, to basically allow the slaughter of wild horses in this country for human consumption and he didn't there was no debate there was no vote there was no none of that you know nobody nobody knew about this until it was through on this bill um and it created this massive firestorm of argument and politics and and protests and it was uh several years of fighting to get that removed and a lot of people involved wow so it's it's gone it's it's gone it's done it's gone. Horse slaughter is now illegal in this country. And it, that was the beginning of that fight. Huh. I was going to, my follow-up question was like, how long for like empty shelves until people just like start eating their, their, their horses, especially the ones that are like lawn ornaments that nobody actually uses or rides. Well, if Venezuela is any indication, it's not long. Before the end of the year or maybe next year? What's your 2022 20, bingo card look like? Eating horses? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I did not have uh, the uprising of Canada on my bingo card. So I'm going to withhold judgment. <laughs> That's true. Just like we we're, we're almost th into month three and we got to start over. Just clear the clear the board. I want a new one. I, I want a new card. Yeah. <laughs> so you're big into livestock. Mm -hmm. and it all integrates together so you've got you, you talked about your greenhouse mm -hmm. so um you want to tell me more about that sure yeah uh we just finished building our 120 foot long greenhouse it's a high tunnel um it was oh i did see pictures job. of that yep That's and crazy. Um, that is um it's going to be an integral part of our food production here obviously i mean that's a that's a lot of space to create food um we've ended up in kind of an interesting situation here in this community we're we're in a food desert um and you wouldn't expect that in like northern montana you would think people would be pretty self-sufficient but up here there's not a whole lot of fresh food um there are a lot of ranches but they are they're all in the commodity system so they ship their cattle to feedlot and they don't direct market. Uh, so up here, there's there's really not a lot of local food available. And we realized this very quickly when we got here. Um, and our community made a huge point to accost us at every opportunity and make sure that we were going to be creating food here. It was like, oh, oh. you have cows, oh, okay. you have pigs, you have greenhouse, like you're going to be feeding us, right? <laughs> So um, we, we have scaled much faster than we expected here. Um, okay. And I think that's Good. going to continue. So, you know, we, we came into this kind of looking at it like, well, we're going to build this house and we're going to build our farm and it's going to be a bit of a process. Um, we're not going to get a whole lot done and we're not going to try to market for a while. Um, before we even had a house, like we're living in a camper and people were showing up at our door to buy milk and eggs and demanding it. It's like, we, we need food and you guys are doing some stuff here and we want to be involved. And, um, we actually had at one point, like 15 neighbors packed into our camper holding this community meeting going, Hey, what are you guys going to be growing? What can we count on? So I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> so we're, we're crazy enough to be building a house and a farm at the same time and, and trying to feed the community. And, um, so far, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a decent job, I think, with the, with the milk and the eggs at least. And this year, the produce will come online with this greenhouse. So it's been a, a bit of a project, but well worth doing. That's awesome. I did not expect that answer when you said that they accosted you. I was like, <laughs> given 
the surrounding area be like get out of here or like i'm gonna smash your tomatoes or something i don't know like like that's i i mean that's cool was that intentional when you moved there like did you know like this is a food desert and i'm gonna capitalize on that um you know, we had noticed going to the grocery store that there was a, a, a lack of good produce. Um, we didn't know coming into it that there were so few farms here marketing to the public, though. Um, that was that was a surprise, to be honest. I mm -hmm. thought we were going to come into this vibrant little community where a lot of people had, you know, gardens and farms and, you know, meat and things like that. And, and it's it, it just was not that way. I was kind of shocked. Um, so it's a, it, it's a, it's a little bit of pressure to be honest, you know, coming into a community like this where, where people are kind of looking at us like, Hey, you're, you're our hedge. Things are getting weird. Are you going to be able to feed us? It's like, man, this is, this is, you know, we're, we, we've got some, we, it's going to take some time to, yeah. to be able to, to do that. Um, and we're not going to feed the whole community. So a uh, big part of what I'm doing at this point is, is trying to, help people set up their homesteads here and, and encouraging people to set up gardens and greenhouses and, you know, anything I can do to support you, you know, I, I'll have, I'll happily show up and, and, and help you learn. And, um, but you know, we can't do this ourselves. So y'all need to, you know, have some food autonomy too, and, and sovereignty here. Um, so that's, that's also becoming part of our life here that I didn't really anticipate. Um, that's amazing but, though. That's really great. That, um, I mean, that's a great way to like get to know your neighbors. Like, I like that. Like, I like that guy. He's pretty nice. This guy's kind of a dick though. I'm still going to help him with his garden. Cause I don't want dicks knocking on my door asking for whatever, like for me to feed them. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, the, the deal, like we need more decentralization in our food system and like you moving to that area and producing food, like you're the centralization point, but now you're trying to like, okay, you all need to grow your own thing. Put it on us. You can grow a tomato, like, or whatever it is you eat, like, it'll be fine. Like just, so that's, that's awesome. That's awesome that you, that you're doing that. I didn't know you're doing that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, we, we, we're actually thinking now that we need to formalize it a little bit and create some workshops and some classes moving forward. Um, we are also building a farm store on our property. That's, that's a big part of our build here. Um, cool. So I'm trying to get the word out that, you know, along with that farm store comes an opportunity for our neighbors to market some of their goods and maybe get a little bit more um, income independent as well and create a, a little side income for themselves. Um, the, you know, the outpouring of support for the farm store has been just incredible from this community. So if people want it. They just didn't know how to organize it and they didn't know how to get started. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of young people flooding into this community and a lot of them are, are urban refugees and suburban refugees from cities. So, um, you know, they know that the system is destabilizing. They know that it's not dependable they know that it's probably going to get worse, um, but they don't know what to do about it except run to the countryside, right? But that's that's yeah. the first step. That's not, you can run to the countryside and still starve, you know, just like you can in a city. Um, so there's there's this huge learning curve. And I, I think helping people through that learning curve is, is going to end up being a, an integral part of what we're trying to do here um, beyond just directly feeding people. Because like I said, we can, you know, we can only feed so many with our own labor. Um, but if we can decentralize, like you're saying, and, and convince people that this is worth doing and it's not that difficult and you can learn these skills, you get your hands on the dirt and you can make food come out of the dirt with just a little bit of effort and a little bit of knowledge, then we might be, you know, in a much better position in the next few years to ride out like whatever's coming, which, you know, it could be inflation, could be, you know, who knows? Yeah, absolutely. I was just at a farm store this morning and um, they open at nine. I got there a little bit after 10. They um, had already ran out of raw milk, but like had just gotten some 
sometime between whenever they ran out and whenever I showed up. So I was like, I'll take a gallon and a half. Like that's yeah. Cool. Like, I guess it's lucky that I showed up when I did. Cause I was like, I hope they don't run out and they did, but they got more. So it just goes to show you like how, how popular that type of thing is. Like, I'm sure we're way of like, a, like the population here is more dense where I'm at than where you are. Um, so there's something to be said for that, but so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And I, I think a lot of this is, is somewhat new as well. Um, you know, I, I, I've been homesteading for the better part of a decade and a half now. And, you know, five, eight years ago, there was not this kind of demand that we're seeing now. Um, you know, I, I sold goat milk, <clears throat> black market, uh, <laughs> I sold goat milk for a lot of years and produce. Is there any um, other way? Right. Well, now it's legal. That's good. It, it took us, took Montana a while, but sure. we can do it now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I always kind of had to market things, you know, I had to put effort into marketing and now it's not like that. I think, I think there's been a sea change in the way people are experiencing the world. Um, I think COVID and the lockdowns and the supply chain issues are, are, you know, of course driving that, but, um, it's been, it's been really interesting to see how people's psychology has changed around food, food production and food buying. Uh, I didn't expect that it would be such a, a rapid change in buying habits like I've seen. Um, it's been very, very rapid from, hey, you know, that's great that you have milk and produce, but, you know, it's cheaper at the store and, you know, it's it's I can go to the farmer's market and that's fine to, oh, my goodness, I need to know local producers. Like, I want to have this relationship now because I don't trust mm -hmm. the grocery store anymore. So that's Absolutely. been Absolutely. Um, what do you, you, I'm a, you said you had 150 laying hens, right? Yeah. What do you sell a dozen eggs for up there? Uh, $5 a dozen. Okay. Okay. Um, I got a buddy down here who's got like 350, 450, somewhere in there. It's a lot. And he goes for $6 a dozen down here. And he, um, We'll sell to restaurants for a little bit of a better price, maybe five fifty for a dozen, depending. I don't know, yeah. but so, um, no, yeah, he he sells a lot of eggs. Um, so, so I guess we kind of already talked about the um, implementing live. wheel of death thing okay there we go um so what are you what are you trying to what does your plan look like with your animals and your um in your grazing pasture maybe your garden um are you gonna bring in like chickens into like your your garden or your high tunnel and to like you know um kind of prep the garden area that way at all yeah we we've played with that idea um for sure uh this this winter we thought we would put the chickens in the high tunnel but they did so well in their portable coop that we didn't feel the need to um okay. and right right now we have our meat rabbits in the high tunnel they're doing really well in there and we have some quail so once we have vegetables growing in there i, I wouldn't put chickens in because chickens are damaging um but the quail are kind of filling that niche. So they, they will cool. take the bugs right off the plants. They produce a lot of eggs. They're good to eat. Um, so they might end up just being the birds that live in there. We, we don't know. We're going to have to play with that a little bit. Um, of course, if we had a really harsh winter, like 30 below, the chickens would probably need to go into the high tunnel. Um, so far that hasn't been the case. So, um, you know, at this point, our plan is, to experiment. This is, I see, I see this property as a giant laboratory. Um, you know, this is a climate I haven't worked with before. 
Um, this is a piece of property I haven't worked with before. The soil is very different than what I'm used to. Um, the rainfall, you know, the seasons are longer here. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, so it's just going to take a lot of experimentation and, and seeing what works and, and, you know, playing with it. Um, but already in six months, you know, we started pretty late in the season. We brought our cattle here in like September. Um, and they immediately improved the land with, with just like two cycles, one or two cycles of rotational grazing before the grass went dormant. We were seeing better growth. We were seeing greener pasture. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens this coming year and, and to just keep working with it. I mean, that's always the key, right? Is to make small changes, observe, see, see what happens. I mean, things, you know, you yeah. start changing things in an ecosystem, you're, you're going to have second and third order effects that maybe you don't anticipate. So, um, for me, it's always about, you know, making changes slowly and working with all these moving parts and seeing, you know, seeing what works and what doesn't, because what works here isn't going to work for somebody five miles down the road and vice versa. Sure. So yeah. we, we really just have to play with it and, and see how things go. Very nice. Question about the high tunnel. Was there a grant program for the high tunnel that you uh, got in on or um, because I've heard about that, that you can get, it's like NRCS or something like that does grants for high tunnels. You know, I just heard about that program for the first time today from one of my customers. No. <laughs> so no is the short answer. <laughs> I bet that made you mad. A little bit, a little bit. Although I think they have like an $8,000 limit on that grant and ours was a bit more expensive than that. So oh. um, it wouldn't have been a whole lot of help anyway. Sure. I did I did hear like sometimes they pay like half or a third or something. It depends on, depends on the thing. And it might not even be the one you want, that the one that they make you get or something. I don't, I don't know how the program works. Well, maybe heard. we'll, we'll put up a second one and, there you go. Yeah, just inside the one you already built. <laughs> That's right. Double microclimate might work. Yeah. yeah. So sounds like you're helping others get prepared by um, helping them grow their own food. That's a pretty good start. I mean, that's a big start for a lot of people. But how else are you helping other people get prepared? Um, screaming from the rooftops that they need to get prepared is, is a big part of it. Uh, you know, it, I, I think, I think a lot of people have, um, kind of a gut feeling that things are not as they used to be and they need to do something about it. But, um, there are still a lot of people that I think are, are deeply dependent and don't see a way out of that or don't see a reason to get out of that. So, um, I have a lot of conversations with people like, Hey, you know, are you aware that we're, we're seeing a, a fertilizer shortage this coming year that's really going to impact agriculture. Um, are you aware that we're, we're seeing like record inflation that is going to make it difficult to buy food? You know, your food dollar is not going to stretch as far. Um, we've got, you know, the bird flu issue getting ready to hit. And that's something that local um, poultry producers are already really concerned about. So, you know, there are all these things kind of stacking up that, maybe people who are outside of the farm and ranch sphere aren't as aware of. Um, so having those conversations is a big part of it. And then providing, you know, the positive uh, aspect of, Hey, you know, okay, this is what's, what's potentially coming down the pipe, but that doesn't mean that it's all doom and gloom. You know, you can be optimistic. This is the doomer optimism thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Optimistic and, um, you can take steps now that are going to make this a lot smoother for your family to ride through. Um, and it can be as simple as, you know, some, some tomatoes on the patio in containers or a few chickens in the backyard, start small, you know, don't get in over your head. Um, and, and also develop relationships with local producers, right? That's a big part of this is like, we, we're, we're just one farm, but there are farms everywhere. I mean, this is Montana. There's farms and ranches all over the state. Um, a lot of amazing people doing really amazing work and producing a ton of food and you need to support them so that they can continue to produce food and grow and scale their operations. And, um, 
it's going to make it a lot easier for all of us to ride out whatever comes down the line. And even if nothing happens, even if things carry on as they always have, and you can go to the grocery store and get everything you need there, this is worth doing because the food quality is better. You're going to have better health over time. You're going to be more connected with your food. You're going to learn better cooking skills. You're going to have better flavors in your kitchen. You know, there are all these reasons. So I, I kind of try to have conversations with people on their level and approach it from whatever angle they're most comfortable with, whether it's just culinary delights or, oh my goodness, the ship is burning and you need to do something about it. Um, there's a lot of room in between, <laughs> in between those two extremes um, yes. to have these conversations. So, and that kickstarts the education process. And then people go, okay, well, what do I need to do? Okay. That's an important question. Now we can start looking for answers and exploring what's going to work for you and your situation. Sure. I mean, when you talk to people like that, you have to have a lot of restraint because like you can't scare them off because then they'll just like, never mind. I'm just going to do whatever I was doing and hope it keeps working. Like grocery store, Costco, Sam's club, Walmart, all that. I got to have my, like put it all on my target red card. Like I'm, uh, it's going to keep hoping that works because, you know, so they talk about, I think a really easy one is food to start mm -hmm. with storing food and then, you know, the gardening, like plant a couple tomatoes, have some chickens or whatever. Like that's easy, but like where you could really scare people off. It's like, what if your well stopped working? What would you do? Mm -hmm. What if you couldn't get gas? What would you do? What if they cut off power to your house or just lost power or whatever? What would you do? Like, do you have a generator? Like, you know, it's very like you could go down that rabbit hole hard and they'll be like, ah, oh, never mind. Like, plug your ears. Like, I don't want to hear it. Like, and yeah, so, yeah. But, I mean, I mean, no, nobody, nobody wants to face the idea that they could end up having to live an Amish life. <laughs> you know, people aren't ready. It's for starting that. to look better, though, doesn't it? It does. I mean, for me, yeah, absolutely. But you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as tight in as, as some might be. So, yeah. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, is Bitcoin part of your preparedness? Oh yes. Yeah. Are you yeah, a maximalist? Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm a land maximalist. Um, you oh, know, what? a land maximalist. What does that um, mean? You know, well, we hold Bitcoin, but it's not our primary investment. Um, our primary okay. investment is land tools, tangibles. Uh, oh, you know. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was like, is that like a crypto thing that I've never heard of? <laughs> No, yeah, maybe you could know. just start a, a coin. We'll do a new ICO or whatever. And just the ticker is L-A-N-D and somehow NFT something, something, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It sounds like a shit coin to me. <laughs> That's why it has to have value. Like it needs to be non, non-fungible. That's right. Um, yeah, no, we, we hold some, some good old traditional Bitcoin and, um, you know, otherwise we're, we're sinking resources into land, livestock tools. Um, we just brought home a sawmill, uh, you know, things that, that we can continue to produce value with if, sure. you know, whatever yeah. happens, happens. Um, I think Bitcoin is wonderful. I think it's, it's going to be, um, an exceptionally powerful tool for sovereignty and for the decentralized revolution that we're looking at trying to drive here. Um, but I don't think it's everything. And, you know, I think there are a lot of people that, that look at Bitcoin as the end all be all and the final solution that they need for the financial system. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is, it is a good store of value potentially and a, a you know, a, a tool for exchange. And I, I love everything about, uh, its story, its background and its, its future, um, but I don't think that we should be just stacking sats at the expense of the real things because you can't eat a Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin can potentially provide you food. Um, but right now, you know, you, you actually need food and you need tools and you need space. And those are things that I think are, are very, very worth investing in as well. I think a couple of things. One, 
that no, you can't eat a Bitcoin, but you can't eat a sawmill either. That's true. I think cash, like the US dollar being a soft asset, people don't have like they don't think of anywhere else to put a soft asset like cash into anything other than Bitcoin being a hard asset. So like for you to be able, like you diversify in putting in some into like Bitcoin and then some into like a sawmill, the sawmill itself doesn't do anything unless you have lumber, but you can produce lumber, which is a hard asset. Like people are going to need it. And so like, that makes a lot of sense to me to be able to, spread it spread it out that way into tools and land and um being able to produce food like if you had like infrastructure um you'd be able to raise more chickens or goats or pigs or literally whatever bees um so yeah it's it's interesting so what a, what do you think about these people that are like get on zero like zero fiat um well, I, I think I think we're all going to end up having to do that sooner or later. Uh, at this point, fiat has its place. Um, I don't love that that's the fact, but it is. You know, there are a lot of places that you need to transact that don't accept crypto, um, and that's you know everywhere from your grocery store to your neighbor who's selling tomatoes. Um, you know, and I mean, those are great places to have the conversation about Bitcoin and to get people on board. Um, but right now we do still have need for fiat and, and for the U S dollar. So we kind of have to work with what we have. And, and I think, I think it would be best to, um, create a, a, a slower transition if we can into, you know, a decentralized currency, um, rather than, <laughs> trying to take this sudden leap and, and destabilizing everything. Um, I know that there are some people who advocate for, you know, just rip it off like a bandaid and, and deal with what, what comes. Um, but not everybody's in a position to, to go through that um, in a graceful way. So I, you know, I mean, I have fiat currency. I have a bank account. I use it every day. Um, but I try to use it in a way that is, is going to increase my stability over time and not increase my dependence on it. So I think that's a, that's a key point that needs to be made. And, and people um, probably realistically are, are going to need it. You know, they're going to need the U S dollar for a while. Um, but I think we can move through it. And I think we've had some recent events that are showing people the power of Bitcoin, like with the truckers in Canada you know, they're freezing accounts, they're freezing people's bank accounts, they're taking their fiat currency right out from under them. Yeah. Um, but there are guys like popping into truckers windows with manila envelopes with $8,000 worth of Bitcoin and saying, Whoa, here, really? I did not hear yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah, I just saw a video the other day, some truckers doing a live stream and this guy pops in his window and hands him this envelope. And he's like, Hey, man, thanks for what you're doing. Here's 8k in Bitcoin. This is so you can keep doing what you're doing and resisting. Um, and this, you know, it had instructions in there on, on how to marshal the Bitcoin and, you know, step by step and, and, you know, keep it off of, uh, keep it out of the system. Um, keep it off of exchanges, of course. And that's, that's the other thing, man, get your coins off the exchange if they're there. Cause Absolutely. we just found out that they're not yours if they're there. Oh, yeah. so. I heard first off that guy handing out or envelopes that is a hardcore orange pilling somebody i mean <laughs> that's amazing i've mm -hmm. never heard of that before that's cool and yeah. um i heard uh i heard of, i i always have been trying to get my in, any of my crypto off of exchanges as fast as possible yeah i heard that coinbase like for all the money that's being exchanged or, you know, crypto that's being bought by like billionaires and all this stuff, all these, these traders that they might not actually have these bitcoins that it would almost be like fraction of the reserve banking of Bitcoin through Coinbase. If that makes sense to people that 
know what it is we're talking about. Like, so get your money off of these exchanges before it's too late. And we do find out that Coinbase is kind of like a huge grift. Like, <laughs> yeah, like what if we ever run on Coinbase and we find out that there's not uh, not enough coins to go around? What do right, we do then? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, so as part of preparedness, what's the difference between self-reliance and self-sufficiency? Hmm. <clears throat> I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, I'm asking you. So to me, self-sufficiency is not possible. Um, I actually wrote a piece on this some years ago called the myth of okay. self-sufficiency. And I, you know, I explored this idea that uh, a lot of people who are new to the homesteading sphere come into this with the idea that, you know, I'm going to go live on the land, like a rugged individualist out in the Alaskan wilderness, and I'm going to provide everything I need for myself and I don't need nobody. Um, that, you know, might work for some extraordinarily skilled people who have all the time in the world and don't really need other humans, but for the average human, that's not the goal here. Um, you know, if we're talking self-sufficiency, uh, you, you know, it, 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 we really can't be completely self-sufficient. We're always going to need something that somebody else makes or produces or provides or, you know, sure. services. Um, we can't do everything. We can't know everything. We can't produce everything. There's just not enough hours in the day. Um, so, you know, I, I really don't like the term self-sufficiency for that reason. Self-reliance, though, you know, I can rely on myself and most of what I need I can produce and what I can't I, I can cover um, is more attractive. Uh, you know, it's it's um, the image that I have is, is more one uh, like interdependence, right? I have a neighbor who welds and I can make leather things and we can trade or I can trade my goat milk for some honey or whatever. Right. Um, so the interdependence of a community um, of self-reliant individuals, I think, is kind of what we need to aim at more than this kind of deep prepper mentality of, of self-sufficiency at all costs and not needing anybody else. I don't think that's realistic. I mean, look at look at that picture um of your parents when they were trappers right i mean heavily heavily self-reliant to like the nth degree mm -hmm. but they couldn't be self-sufficient you said they still had to go into town every now and then to get supplies or whatever it is so like that's like the perfect example of what you're talking about yeah, exactly. I mean, you're not growing coffee beans on the top of a mountain in the winter in Colorado, right? Um, so there are always things you need or you want. And that's, that's fine. That doesn't mean that you're failing at the homesteading dream. Um, I think it's, it's a realistic outlook. Absolutely. So switching gears a little bit here. Who did you piss off on Twitter today? Anybody? <laughs> Any today specifically, it seems well, like that, every day. <laughs> I knew this interview was coming, so I behaved really well today. Um, Hi, I want to talk about drama. I want to. <laughs> I don't know. Did you hear about that guy um, who stole his wife from some other guy? No. Oh, that that I was like that, big, one. that was a big drama today. Um, yeah, some some masculinity influencer. Uh, apparently wrote this this thread about how he stole his wife from some other man she was engaged to and um, he got just dragged through the mud it was kind of glorious because his story was quite awful to be honest <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought about jumping into that one but I thought yeah you know I'm gonna sit this one out and just laugh from the sidelines sure the one I'm thinking about specifically is, I think it was just earlier this week, you uh, got blocked by a soy boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was <laughs> That fun. was funny. That was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, a, um, I think he was a, like a vegan, vegan guy, plant-based guy who jumped into a thread where I commented about, uh, you know, food, of course, because that's usually what I'm talking about. 
And um, he got quite upset about my perspective <laughs> on these things. And um, the, he, he followed me through, you know, from that thread to my, uh, my own comments and my posts and kind of created this, this little drama. It was interesting. Um, and at one point after a, a lot of back and forth, he goes, well, we can agree on Bitcoin and something else. I don't remember what. So I guess we can be friends. And then he blocked me. <laughs> okay. That's what friends do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I like how he was like declaring this is, these are the terms and then out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, people on the internet are interesting sometimes. You, you post a lot on Twitter about needing strong men. What do you mean by that? Well, we do. Um, you know, I, I, I very unironically called myself an anti-feminist for a while on Twitter. I, I removed that. Um, but it, it still stands. You know, I, I, I see that we've we've had um, a, a damaged relationship between men and women. And um, that's that's been going on a long time. I think it started with um, probably with the women's suffrage movement, maybe even before that. But it really took on steam with the sexual revolution of the sixties and, you know, all of this, well, I don't need no man. I'm a strong, independent woman. You know, women need men like fish need bicycles. That was a popular t-shirt in the sixties. Um, and I, I, I think that it's time for our, our social immune system to kick in a little bit and <laughs> realize that that is not a healthy outlook. It's damaged relationships and family systems deeply. Um, in the work I've done over the years doing, uh, you know, equine assisted therapy and counseling for people, um, relationship counseling, family counseling. I've seen this firsthand. I've seen broken family after broken family. And a lot of it I've identified uh, as coming from this primary relationship being damaged. Um, women need men. And we've been told that that's not the case. We've been told that we shouldn't say that or think that. And I think that's that's kind of an illness because it's it's a basic biological fact. I mean, we are we are not the same. We each have different roles and skills that we fulfill. Um, kids, I mean, the the data is very clear. It is in. It is final <laughs> that kids do better in two parent households with a mother and a father present. Um, and I feel like th that should not be something that is um up for argument but it seems to be these days and and that bothers me i i think that this is something we need to fix on the cultural level and you know maybe i can do a little part by knocking some heads and <laughs> arguing with some feminists and and changing that and and telling men you know that you you are needed you are appreciated you are um capable of things that we are not as much as as women like to sometimes pretend that we can do everything a man can do and do it better it's not true um so i you know i i think that this is this is part of of the grand cultural narrative that needs to shift and the sooner it shifts the better off we'll be because i think we're moving into some times where having a strong man in one's home and one's life is is going to absolutely um, potentially make or break the success of a household and a family system. So, you know, we've, we've skated for a while on um, government support stepping into that role. And, you know, it's allowed a lot of women to make choices that they maybe otherwise wouldn't make if they didn't have that support in place. So, you know, we, we really need to examine this, I think. And, create a different narrative and one that celebrates the the roles of the genders and the need for both people to show up as whole humans in that relationship and provide what we are designed to provide to the family system and not at the expense of the other you know and not as a strong independent individual in this in this system because it's it's not working it's just not working do you think that's intentional? Like the <sighs> castration of men in our society? Is that like by design, do you think? 
I think it is. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that there was some, you know, secret meeting in a dark room where a bunch of social engineers decided, hey, we need to eliminate men. From... It was probably on Zoom. <laughs> it was probably on Zoom. <laughs> George Soros was definitely there. Absolutely. Um... <laughs> and Klaus Schwab and Klaus Schwab. Bill Gates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I do think it's intentional. I think, um, you know, the, the well, there's probably multiple aspects of this, and this is a whole other conversation. Um, but convincing women that being in the home is uh, basically slavery, and, you know, they're not supposed to feel um, satisfied with that, and that the only place to be really satisfied and, and fulfilled and whole as a human is in a boardroom somewhere. Um that I mean, the immediate effect of that was was creating um, a whole, you know, fifty percent of the the population suddenly becoming taxpayers. You know, it, it created a new tax paying base. So even if we don't go beyond that, that's that's significant. I mean, that that significantly increased the power of the government because of the influx of money. And then, of course, you know, the after effects of that were that it depressed wages. So now, you know, with women in the workforce, men don't make as much money as they used to. So now the, the single earner household is much more difficult to achieve. So both parents have to be gone. Now the kids are in school being raised by the government. And, you know, when the kids are being raised by the government, then they are uh, susceptible to the programming that keeps this whole thing going. So, you know, I, I do think it was intentional, maybe, maybe not as a well thought out plan, but definitely as a way to sway the population into um, giving up a lot of autonomy and sovereignty that we used to have in favor of, you know, the state taking the central place in the household. And that's been extremely damaging to our families and homes. Absolutely. It, man, it almost seems like whatever the mainstream's doing, like mainstream society, you got to go the other way. Like, obviously not lot, like, don't take that, like, to the absolute, like, hmm, people aren't eating rocks. I should start eating rocks. But like, a lot of people are, a lot of people are putting their kid in uh, government school, got a homeschool or whatever other option. Like, lit like, just don't do that. People are going to the grocery store. I better grow my own food. Like, just got to like, do you remember that um, that movie? Maybe you've never seen it. Lucky Number Eleven. I didn't see it. There's a move called the Kansas City Shuffle. If everyone's looking right, you go left. If everyone's going left, you go right. Like so, it's just like, just gotta you gotta swim upstream sometimes. Like it's it's tough. My my wife does stay home with our son, and somehow. We like she when she went back to work at like uh, three months after um, our son was born. Her um, her boss was just awful to her. Just like I don't. It was like something happened. I don't even know what it was, but her boss was just just terrible. And so she'd come home just all, like upset all the time, and she's like. I crunched the numbers. We can afford for me to stay home. And I'm like, if you say so, let's do it. Like, this is, yeah, absolutely. Let's do this. And so we, so far, uh, a year and a half later, we're still making it work. So. That's good. I bet, I bet the, the whole family system has benefited from that decision. Absolutely. It's, I don't like leaving. <laughs> I don't like leaving the house because it's like, you know, he'll be standing at the door waving by and it's like, oh, damn it. I'll just, just throw my keys in the ditch and just stay home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah, we've been very lucky to be able to make that work. So because I'm sure a lot of people would like to have it this way and just can't either can't figure it out, don't want to figure it out or. I mean, it's honestly to get a little, little personal here. If my, if my wife was like career driven, like she was, she like, she 
she was like working in coffee shops or whatever. Like that's her thing. She, you know, was a store manager and then started opening up stores for a chain and whatnot. And they were like having her travel around the country, opening up coffee shops or whatever. And like, that was her thing. And then I ruined that by moving us to Montana. So, um, and then she was trying to get her foothold in here. And her last job was at, uh, at the airport, Missoula. And it just like, it all fell apart. So like for, for her, if she was more career driven and like wanted whatever she wanted to do, like, I want to, um, I want this. I'd say go for it. Like, if that's what you want to do, I'll be a stay at home dad. I don't care. Like, it's just, that's just us personally, but it, that's not how it worked out. So we're the conventional mom stays at home, dad goes to work instead of mom and dad go to work and you get raised by an almost stranger. Mm hmm. I'm I'm really glad you were able to figure out a way to make that happen. And I think uh, most people, if they were willing to make some changes, could figure out how to make that work in their lives. Um, yeah. It would require some downsizing, you know, but I think it's it's worth it. Oh, you mean living below your means? Oh, yeah. like a peasant? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, well, hey. Very cool. Uh, we've been going for almost two hours now. Um, do you want to? You want to plug? Do you want to wrap up on anything before we do do plugs? Uh, no, I mean this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm I'm really glad to uh, have been invited on. I appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate yours. Been, been a lot of fun. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. You can find Lauren on Twitter at Lauren in the Wild. Her handle is Bull Respector. What did that come from, by the way? What does that mean? <laughs> is it pretty uh, self-explanatory? It is. Um, we bought our first bull and had a lot of conversations in our house about what that means. Um, you know, and a big part of that is is not forgetting to respect that that animal could kill you if he decided to, and and that bulls are dangerous even when they seem very placid. So, um somewhere in that conversation i said man i'm a lifetime bull respecter because i have been chased by them i have been terrified by them i've had to jump over fences to get away from them so it it stuck <laughs> understood understood <laughs> um you said you're working on a website so um yeah. that is are you are you trying to like hook up your farm store through the website i'm assuming so. Yeah, so our website's actually going to start out as a digital farm store, um, you know, until we have a physical location built, um, which is, is going to come a little bit later. That will serve as like our online ordering system for our neighbors and our community. Um, so they'll be able to log on, see what we have in stock, put their That's orders cool. in. Yeah. And that'll Very be our cool. app. Well, great. Um for everyone else, uh, you can follow Farm Hop Life almost everywhere. We'll try to make it hard to not not stay in touch with you. So, great. Thanks for thanks for being on, Lauren. I appreciate it. Thank you.